Okay, then let's begin with our uh, actual discussion of field theory and then quantum field theory. This entire section two is on quantization of free fields, first of all, to get started. And uh, today we will begin with uh, section 2.1 on general classical field theory, and we will specifically uh, look at local field theory and uh, relativistic field theory also. And so let's just define briefly what we mean by classical field theory. If the field theory is local, then it can be described by a local Lagrangian, which depends on the fields and the derivatives of the fields. And so we always assume that the Lagrangian L, Lagrangian density, depends on some set of fields which I generically write as phi i. i is an index which runs through all the fields in our field theory. And the Lagrangian is allowed to depend also on the derivatives of the field. And these can be all derivatives with respect to space-time coordinates. So I write it generically as d rho phi i, where d rho is a relativistic derivative with respect to time or space. And we do not allow higher derivatives than first derivatives in uh, this course here. And uh, so that is our general Lagrangian. So these are all our fields. And the argument is always uh, a space-time position x, where when I write x without index, then I mean the full four vector time and space. And these are first derivatives. Also evaluated at the point x. Therefore, the theory is local. This Lagrangian density is specific to one space-time point x, and the fields and their derivatives are evaluated all at the same space-time point. OK, then we can define an action. which I call S, and the action is defined as the d4x integral over the Lagrangian density. And then uh, we can do principle of least action and require that uh, our field configurations minimize the action or uh, at least extremalize the action. And this gives us the Euler-Lagrange equations. For the field theory, which uh, I just copy, uh, zero is equal to d by d rho of the derivative dl with respect to d rho phi i minus derivative dl with respect to d phi i. And so uh, these uh, Lagrangian equations hold for all fields phi i. So you select one of the many fields in your theory, let's call it phi i, and then you, for this phi i, do those derivatives with respect to phi i and the derivatives d rho phi i. So for every field in your theory, there is one such Lagrange equation which combines derivatives and uh, non-derivative terms. So that is the basis of classical field theory. And uh, I do not want to say more to that because we will, of course, discuss many examples of concrete field theories like scalar field, vector field, spinor field theories later on. But what I really want to show you now, uh, and we discussed about it already, is the Noether theorem, which is one of the most important theorems in theoretical physics, which forms also, uh, let's say, the conceptual basis of a large part of theoretical physics in the past century. Namely, it gives a relationship between symmetries on the one hand and conserved quantities on the other hand. And because of that relationship, the role of symmetries is really emphasized and amplified. And uh, as you might know, the construction of concrete theories such as standard model, quantum electrodynamics, and many other um, proposed theories are often based on symmetries and the importance of symmetries is derived from the Noether theorem. So let us derive the Noether theorem. Okay, and uh, 
the symmetries in question that um, the Noether theorem talks about are infinitesimal symmetries or continuous symmetries. Not uh, symmetries like reflection or so, but continuous symmetries such as translations or Lorentz transformations or some internal phase symmetries where you can do a continuous symmetry transformation where you can have a limit to the identity transformation. And then you can speak of infinitesimal variations. So you could call it an infinitesimal field transformation or variation of the field. And so you would say your field phi i goes into a new field phi i prime after the transformation in question. And this phi i prime is given by the original field plus a small variation delta phi i. And this delta phi i would depend on some transformation parameter and that parameter could go continuously to zero. And then you get the identity transformation. Okay, and uh, so uh, this means um, that you can also plug in arguments. So phi i prime at some argument x is given by the old field at the same argument x plus the variation delta phi i at the same argument x. So if you want to do a space-time transformation like Lorentz, then at first the arguments change. But for the Noether theorem, you always have to bring every transformation into this form where the arguments are everywhere the same. And you can achieve that by Taylor expansion, for example. Anyway, this is the form the Noether theorem talks about. And now we assume that this transformation is a symmetry of the action. That means under the same symmetry transformation, the action S goes into itself. And uh, that is equivalent to saying that the Lagrangian density either goes into itself or it might go into itself plus a total derivative. Let's call it d rho of some quantity x rho. Because if uh, you allow for this additional term, and you integrate over d4x in the action, then this term drops out because of boundary conditions at infinity. So uh, this is the symmetry and uh, we allow for such an extra term and then the Noether theorem tells us that uh, there exists a conserved quantity. And in our local field theory setup, this is not only globally conserved, but it's a locally conserved quantity. So it's a conserved um, current. Let's call it generically J rho, which satisfies this conservation law or also called continuity equation. C rho is equal to D rho J rho. This is the same equation as it is satisfied by the electric current and electric charge. It uh, means, um, globally speaking, that uh, the um, charge in question is conserved, but it can move around from here to there. And so the charge in some volume can change only by charge flowing through the surface area of the region. And uh, that is expressed microscopically in this continuity equation here. So this is the Noether theorem. And now let's prove it and derive at the same time a concrete form of this conserved current J rho. Okay, so how can we prove it? The proof of the Noether theorem follows always a very, very simple idea. And I recommend you that you um, remember that simple idea because it's easier to remember the full proof of the Noether theorem than to remember the final expression for this J row. Therefore, the recommendation is that whenever you want to use the Noether theorem in your daily life, just do the proof directly for your symmetry in question, and then you obtain an expression for the current J rho. It's uh, much better that way uh, compared to remembering um, this thing. Okay, so how does the proof work? The proof is uh, 
very simple and it is based on using the transformation law for the Lagrangian in two different ways. So we have two different ways to evaluate the symmetry transformation of the Lagrangian. And at the end of the day, we compare the two ways, set them equal, and then we have the conservation law. Okay? That is, that is basically the only thing that you have to remember. So what is the first way? The first transformation law is our assumption. Our assumption means that somebody has done an explicit calculation, uh, defined uh, an explicit uh, symmetry transformation, plugged it in, worked for some while until they found, ah, okay, actually the Lagrangian transforms in this way. This is the result of some calculation that we cannot do in general, but somebody might have done it for some symmetry transformation and then we assume that this is the result. So that is our assumption and in concrete cases this must follow from some concrete calculation. Now there is a second way to evaluate the symmetry transformation of the Lagrangian and the second way it can be done always. It's completely independent of the concrete form of the symmetry transformation. The second way can even be done if there is no symmetry at all. Namely, what is the variation of the Lagrangian if you only know that phi goes to phi plus delta phi? Very simple, because the Lagrangian depends on phi. So we can say this goes into L of phi plus delta phi and d rho phi plus d rho delta phi with indices. So that is always true. But now you can calculate. How can we calculate? We assume that these deltas are very small. So we evaluate this at first order in the deltas. And we can do that by Taylor expansion. So this is equal by Taylor expansion to L of phi i and d rho phi i. And now plus some terms coming from the transformation in the arguments. So if phi is shifted to phi plus delta phi, how does the Lagrangian change? Of course it changes to L of phi plus the derivative dL derivative with respect to phi i times delta phi i. That's just the Taylor expansion plus higher orders in delta. And the same, the second argument is shifted by plus d rho delta phi. So we get plus dl derivative with respect to d rho phi i times d rho delta phi i. And here we have only neglected, let's call it order delta square terms, they were neglected. So, and this line is always correct even if you know nothing about uh, whether this delta phi i is a symmetry or not. This is always possible. And now you can always also do a very important step. Namely, uh, these two terms, they can now be rearranged. And what is the rearrangement? You can use the equation of motion, which is here. And then you can replace the dl by d phi by that term. And that is the crucial step. So we now use the equation of motion at this point, and then we get L. Let's drop the arguments. L without arguments is always the same thing. And here plus d rho of dl derivative with respect to d rho phi i times delta phi i plus the other term dl by d d rho phi i times d rho delta phi i plus the higher order terms. And now those two terms can be combined. How can they be combined? It's just the product rule. It's just the product rule. So this is equal to L plus the total derivative of the product d rho of d L by d d rho phi i times delta phi i plus higher order terms. And now we have it. So you see that the variation of the Lagrangian 
can always be written as a total derivative. And if at the same time we have a symmetry, then this total derivative is equal to that derivative and therefore we get some conserved current. Or if this happens to be zero, then this is immediately the conserved current. But uh, you know, the second derivation can always be done no matter what. And this is my recommendation to you. Remember that the Noether theorem simply is derived by comparing those two items. And the second item requires uh, one trick, namely to rearrange one term by using the equation of motion. And then we have our expression. Namely, we get a conserved current, j rho, which we can read off here, which would be the difference between that and that, dl derivative with respect to d rho phi i times delta phi i minus x rho. And this current automatically satisfies d rho j rho is equal to zero, where this equation holds if the equation of motions are met actually. So by using the equations of motion, this is conserved. So the dynamics of the theory conserves this quantity. And then we can also define a conserved charge, Q, which can be defined as the three integral over the zero component, like in electrodynamics, where this would be the charge density and that the overall charge. And then we get d by dt of that charge if the equation of motions are valid is zero. Okay, so this is the Noether theorem for a field theory. And uh, I would stress that the proof is actually simple and it is based on that idea that I now mentioned several times, which I think uh, is easy to remember. And so this Noether theorem has of course a lot of important applications. It can be applied to Poincaré invariants, where you would derive uh, conserved currents for translational invariants, and the conserved charge for translation invariants is the momentum. Conserved quantity related to translation invariants by definition is the momentum. So if you do that here for translational invariants, you get uh, not one Q, but you get four different such quantities for the four different directions of translational invariance. So you would get an index mu and the quantity would not called Q, but would be called P mu, the momentum. You can also do it for internal symmetries. Like phase invariance. and more complicated other symmetries, such as the symmetries that appear, for instance, in the standard model of particle physics. So, and uh, you can look at the exercise sheet already. There is one question uh, with a long-winded explanation on the Noether theorem, where you should apply this uh, to Poincaré invariants in completely general terms. So we will later on uh, apply the Noether theorem to Poincaré invariants for concrete theories like spin zero, spin one half, spin one, and then derive the appropriate conserved quantities. But one can also do it in the general case and uh, your exercise is just apply this to translation invariants and to Poincaré invariants in complete generality. And then you will obtain some completely general expressions for the conserved quantities, which would be the momentum and also angular momentum and boost um, operators or conserved currents for that. And of course, those general expressions will contain the Lagrangian uh, in the formulas or um, some generic fields phi i like here. And uh, so you do not get completely explicit expressions, but generic expressions, which can then be specialized to concrete cases. So let me 
took some time. Good. Uh, the battery still seems okay, so let's go on. Now let us begin quantizing something and let's begin with a spin zero uh, scalar field. Right, so let us consider a real scalar field, which I now call just phi without index, phi of x. And uh, the name scalar field tells us exactly how this field transforms under Poincaré transformations, namely with this uh, simple transformation rule. And uh, we now ask in the spirit of being as general as possible, uh, remember this discussion of traditional approach or Weinberg's approach to quantum field theory. So let's be as general as possible. And here for our starting point, it means let us try to find the very, very simplest field theory with a scalar field, which is Lorentz invariant and which gives the simplest type of equations of motion. And the simplest, um, first of all, uh, Lorentz, Oh, sorry, let's call it the simplest Lorentz invariant Lagrangian, uh, which gives the simplest type of equations of motions. And the simplest type of equations of motions are linear equations of motion. Linear equations of motion are the simplest ones and later of course we can do all sorts of more complicated um, combinations. We get linear equations of motion if the Lagrangian is bilinear or quadratic in the field because the equations of motion come from first derivatives with respect to fields. Therefore we are searching for the simplest Lorentz invariant Lagrangian which is uh, quadratic in this scalar field phi. And so L uh, could be the following. So one term which is Lorentz invariant would be phi square. And that is bilinear quadratic in the field and it's Lorentz invariant because the field itself is also uh, Lorentz invariant. And so let's put this term with some coefficient m square over 2 times minus. Um, the coefficient is of course just the name. And there is one other term which is simple and gives linear equations of motion but which also contains derivatives, d rho phi. So d rho phi on its own is not Lorentz invariant because it contains the open index so that would transform like a four vector. But if we do d rho phi times d rho phi then it's Lorentz invariant. And that is the simplest Lorentz invariant term which contains derivatives and uh, which is bilinear in the field. And so that is our definition of this simplest Lorentz invariant local uh, relativistic scalar field theory. And uh, that is the theory that we want to study and quantize now. So the question is, what is the quantum theory that corresponds to this classical field theory defined by that Lagrangian? Okay, and the quantum theory is constructed using the same logic as we applied in the case of the Schrödinger field where we came from multiparticle theory and then uh, re-derived the multiparticle theory from a field theory quantization and we will go through exactly the same quantization procedure here as well. So there are always some typical steps that we have to go through. We first need to clarify a little bit what the classical theory actually is. In particular, we need Poisson brackets uh, to define the classical equations of motion and then there is a quantization recipe called canonical quantization and that tells us to replace classical objects by quantum operators acting on some Hilbert space of states and uh, they have commutation relations which are derived from the classical Poisson brackets. So we need to establish first some classical properties and let's do that quickly. 
So I would call that the classical setup. And so we begin with the Euler-Lagrange equations. What are the Euler-Lagrange equations for this Lagrangian here? So we get zero is equal to dl derivative with respect to d rho phi uh, d rho thereof minus dl derivative with respect to d phi. And what do we get here in this particular case? If we take the derivative of L with respect to d rho phi, ah, I forgot one half here, so please add the factor one half. So if we do now the derivative of dl with respect to d rho phi, what do we get? d rho phi appears here and it appears squared. It appears squared, so th and that is regarded as one variable, right? The variable appears squared. So if we take the derivative, the one half cancels, and we get just the variable itself. Then we get another d rho from here, so we get d rho of d rho phi. That is what we get from the first term, and then we get minus dl by d phi. That gives here uh, two phi that cancels the one half, so we get m square times phi, and the minus also cancels, so plus m square times phi. So let's copy the equation once more. Zero is equal to the d'Alembert operator plus m square acting on phi. That is the so-called Klein-Gordon equation. This equation is often also discussed in um, relativistic quantum mechanics contexts where the Klein-Gordon equation is used and interpreted as, as some quantum mechanical wave equation. But here it's not a wave equation for quantum theory. Here it's a classical field theory um, Lagrange equation coming from this Lagrangian. Yes, this is a purely classical theory at the moment and that is a classical field. And that uh, satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. So the next classical step would be to look at the canonical momenta, to go slowly from Lagrange to Hamiltonian. So the canonical momenta, let's call them here pi, uh, pi of x and t. They are defined as the derivative of the Lagrangian uh, density with respect to phi dot at the same uh, x and t spacetime point. What is the derivative of L with respect to phi dot? Phi dot is the same as d0 of phi. So where is phi dot? What is the derivative with respect to phi dot? It's phi dot itself, because here there is, if you put rho to zero, you get phi dot times phi dot, phi dot square. The one half cancels again. And so our canonical momentum pi is equal to phi dot. Is that a constraint in the sense that we have defined in the beginning of the semester? It's not. There is no constraint, no relationship between momenta and canonical variables, but here we really get the normal situation that you are familiar with from classical mechanics, where this is related to the time derivative. Then, uh, once we have them, we can define the Hamiltonian. And here, there are no constraints, therefore no problem going to the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is given by the D3x integral of some Hamiltonian density, and the Hamiltonian density is given by a Legendre transformation, namely pi times phi dot minus L. So what happens if we do phi dot times pi minus L? So L contains, uh, by, first of all, if we write down the Hamiltonian, then we practically always have to split 
such Lorentz invariant quantities into the different parts like time derivative, space derivative, because they are treated differently in the Hamiltonian formalism. Remember, that's the big advantage of Lagrange to be directly Lorentz invariant, whereas the Hamiltonian formalism is not Lorentz invariant. It singles out the role of time. And the Legendre transformation singles out the, uh, the, um, the role of time. Therefore, in order to evaluate it, we need to write this as phi dot square minus nabla uh, phi square, for example, right? Or as phi dot square plus di phi times di phi, where we split the row into the time component and the space components. The space components would be this, these upper i and the lower i. But the lower i is nabla, the upper i is minus nabla, so that is the same thing. So if we do that, then you see here pi times phi dot is phi dot square. That cancels one half of that here, and so overall we get one half times phi dot square or pi square, which is the same thing. And then we get minus the rest plus nabla phi square plus uh, times one half plus m square over two times phi square. Okay, so that is the Hamiltonian. So you see that uh, the Hamiltonian is manifestly positive definite because all the terms are squares of real quantities. But uh, it's not Lorentz invariant anymore and the role of time is singled out. Okay, then uh, the last classical point are Poisson brackets. Let's only write them down because there is nothing uh, to calculate. So the Poisson brackets are simply uh, phi of x and t, Poisson bracket with phi of y and t. Poisson bracket is equal to zero. They are always at first only defined for equal time arguments in this canonical formalism. Then phi with pi with the same arguments. That is a delta function in three dimensions of x minus y and pi with itself is zero again. And then from these Poisson brackets you can uh, write down a equivalent formulation of Hamiltonian's equations. So the Hamiltonian equations uh, are not written here, but uh, they are obtained in the usual way, like pi dot is given by the derivative of h with respect to phi, and phi dot is given by the derivative of h with respect to pi, with the appropriate plus minus signs. And this is equivalent to saying that uh, the time derivative of any quantity is given by the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian. Okay, that is our classical theory, and now we can turn to the quantum theory. Just need to check uh, the battery, because I think this will become empty, but apparently not. Okay. So, let us go to the so-called canonical quantization. So canonical quantization is a recipe by which you can turn a classical theory defined by the Hamiltonian formalism into a quantum theory uh, which makes sense and whose classical limit reproduces the original classical theory. Okay, and so the recipe tells us that phi and pi and the Hamiltonian become operators. Phi hat pi hat and h hat, and the Hamiltonian operator h hat is given by the d3x integral over the same Hamiltonian density as we have defined here, which is expressed as a function of pi and phi. And now here we plug into this function the operators 
phi hat and pi hat. That is the recipe to obtain the Hamiltonian. And these operators in the quantum theory, they should satisfy commutation relations. Namely, derived from the Poisson bracket times i h bar. So phi of x and t um, phi operator of y and t commutator is equal to zero for all x and y phi with pi always with the same arguments is i times a three-dimensional delta function and here there would be an h bar if we would use h bar and pi with pi again with the same arguments is zero. That is all a requirement and uh, the requirement contains um, this subtle detail that of course the operators must be defined on some vector space, on some Hilbert space of quantum states and so we must also construct at the end the space of states on which those operator relations actually hold. And maybe such a space doesn't exist and then we run into a contradiction and have to abandon this theory. So. Uh, after this definition, we can specify in which quantum mechanical picture we work, uh, because there is Schrödinger picture, Heisenberg picture, interaction picture, and here it's very nice to directly work in the Heisenberg picture. And in the Heisenberg picture, the operators satisfy some equation of motion for their time dependencies. And they are the same as the classical equation of motions coming from the Poisson brackets. So let's do that here with the correct sign. So phi operator dot at some argument x is given by i times uh, this commutator, namely h commutator with phi hat at the same space-time point x. That is the Heisenberg equation of motion for our operator. And now we can actually evaluate what is the result of this Heisenberg equation of motion because everything is defined. h hat is defined in this way where the curly h stands here. And uh, the commutation relations of the basic building blocks are also known. Therefore, we know enough to fully evaluate this commutator. So let's do it. What is the value of this commutator? So h and phi hat, where do we get some non-zero contribution? So the h contains three terms, pi square and two terms with phi square. Which of the terms here gives a non-zero commutator with phi hat. So you would write here the definition of H. So I could copy all of those terms, but uh, not all of the terms here are relevant. Namely, which term uh, X prime, which term is relevant? This, this or that term? Only the pi term because that gives a non-zero commutator. So it's enough to write here one half pi hat square at x prime. And then we can read off what the commutator is. The commutator here of pi with phi is uh, minus i times the delta function. And uh, then what remains is just the other factor of pi and the integral, and the integral between uh, is cancelled by the delta function. The delta function will give us a three-dimensional delta function between x and x prime. Then the integral collapses and we just get as a result the remaining pi at the point x. And uh, we get minus i from here plus i from here, so we get plus pi at x. So phi dot operator is equal to pi hat operator. That is the Heisenberg equation of motion. And similarly, we can do it for pi. Pi dot is equal by uh, to 
commutator of Hamiltonian with pi hat at x. And here, of course, the other two terms are relevant. D3x prime, one half, and then we have here this nabla phi square plus m square phi square commutator with pi hat at x. Okay, and what happens if we ev evaluate it? So the simpler term is this pi, phi square term, phi square commutator with pi. So that just gives i times the delta function between the arguments here. So what uh, remains is the other factor of phi times m square and the one half cancels. And uh, i times i gives minus one here, so we get minus m square times phi operator at x from this term in the sum. And so from the other term we get something similar, but we have to take care of the derivatives and this is easiest if we imagine briefly partial integration. So uh, one of the Laplace goes on to the other phi, then we get minus phi times Laplace phi. And then what remains is simply minus Laplace of the other phi at x. Okay, then these are our two Heisenberg operator equations of motion between phi dot and pi and pi dot and phi. And if we combine the two, then we can also plug in here because that is an operator identity. So this operator is identical to this operator. And so that phi dot, uh, pi dot is equal, of course, to phi operator double dot, second time derivative. And so then you can combine it with this and you see that the, uh, by the way, uh, minus Laplace times i square gives of course plus Laplace. So if you combine the left hand side and the right hand side, then you see that the operator phi satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. So the Heisenberg equation of motion for the operator fields is the same as the equation of motion coming from the Lagrangian in the classical theory. So the Heisenberg picture phi satisfies the classical equation of motion, but that is an operator identity. So we are not yet done with constructing our quantum theory. We know a lot about the operators. We even know this differential equation, which is satisfied by our field operator. Uh, but we do not yet know the structure of the space of states. So we want to know on which Hilbert space are those operators defined and what we can learn about the possible uh, states in our theory. So that is the next question that we need to discuss the space of states. And then we can also ask how these operators phi or h, uh, how they act on these states. So for example, you might want to know what are the eigenstates and maybe even eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. What are the energy eigenvalues? Because that is obviously a question that you are familiar with and that you usually ask in quantum theories. So let me uh, give you here some reminder of a comparison. We discussed some weeks ago this non-relativistic Schrödinger field uh, coming from the multiparticle theory. And so there we had a Lagrangian and uh, we also did canonical quantization and we obtained an operator, psi hat um, of x vector, which was given by d3p integral over 2 pi cube times e to the i p x times a of p. That was exactly the formula that we wrote down. Let's briefly remind ourselves what that means. 
What it means and what was an important outcome of the formula was that we knew the commutation relations of this A of P. And those commutational relations told us that those A of P act like creation and annihilation operators exactly in the same way as you are known uh, used to from the harmonic oscillator. So they correspond to quantized wave, uh, waves or wave quanta. And you can excite uh, the wave here multiple times or zero times like you can in the harmonic oscillator. And because of that knowledge and because of that comparison, you knew what the space of states was. Namely, the space of states consisted of a vacuum and all of the states that you can excite by acting with a dagger onto the vacuum. So this operator and its properties told us what the space of states was. And because of that connection, we now also know how this psi operator acts on any state in our Hilbert space. And uh, we saw that um, then a particle number was conserved and all these interesting features. But uh, that relationship and uh, the property of A was really decisive. And this uh, result here was actually, we didn't stress it, but it was in the Schrödinger picture. So this field operator did not have a time dependence, and so it was a field operator in the Schrödinger picture. And now we work in the Heisenberg picture. Therefore, let me simply drop the corresponding expression in the Heisenberg picture. What would happen? What would simply happen is that we get here in the exponential an additional time dependent factor which comes from the energy of that state created by this A of P. So we simply get the following modification. We have the same integral d3p over 2 pi cube and then we get the following times d to the minus i omega p times t plus i p x times A of P where this omega p is the frequency or energy corresponding to the momentum p. So in the non-relativistic case, this is p vector square over 2m. So that is the only modification in the Heisenberg picture. And so you get here a time-dependent factor and a certain dispersion relation or a certain relationship between the energy and the momentum component. And so now uh, our question is basically, uh, how does this field phi behave? We want to obtain a similar relationship. Maybe it looks identical, maybe not. But anyway, this is what we aim for. We aim for constructing some operators with a known and simple behavior like this A of P. And then we will see uh, what the differences uh, will be. Okay, so I would call this section uh, solve the quantization. And we need to satisfy all the properties from the previous blackboard. And uh, our aim is to construct such operators like A of P. Therefore, it's a good idea to first start with a Fourier transformation. And a general Fourier transformation does not lose or gain any information um, because uh, it's an uh, identity which you can always write down. We do a four-dimensional Fourier transformation and we write instead of phi hat of x a d4p integral of e to the minus ipx of some Fourier transformed operator phi tilde of p. And so that is of course always possible. You can go in, go in both directions from phi tilde to phi hat or from phi hat to phi tilde. But in this Fourier representation we can learn a few things. So our first relation that uh, our operator must fulfill is the Heisenberg equation of motion, which is here the Klein-Gordon equation. So this thing must satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. We know it, so we can write it down. Zero is equal to box plus m square acting on phi hat of x 
But if we plug that into the Fourier representation, what we obtain is a D4P integral. And then you know that under Fourier, uh, derivative um, becomes minus i times p. And so therefore, from the box, we obtain minus p square plus m square times the same. Okay. So we get under the Fourier integral this prefactor minus p square plus m square, and the whole thing must be zero. When is a Fourier transformation zero? A Fourier transformation is zero if and only if uh, uh, the Fourier components are all zero. That means uh, this thing here under the integral must vanish for all p. And uh, therefore we know, uh, in particular for the product without this exponential factor, p square minus m square times phi tilde must vanish for all p. And that means mathematically that this phi tilde of p must contain a delta function for this object, must contain a factor delta function of p square minus m square. There is no other way. If it contains that function, then you plug it together and then the integral becomes zero, no matter what other factors there are in the Fourier transformation, but uh, without that factor you will get some non-zero result. Therefore we already know that the Fourier transformation can be written as this delta function times something else which has some other p dependence. And so we com can combine the delta function with this integral measure to obtain something interesting which we will always use. Namely we get the Lorentz invariant integration measure, which comes from this combination. And I will give a name for it, which I will always use, dp tilde. This dp tilde depends on the mass, depends on m square, uh, but it's not written. Um, and what it means is the following d4p divided by 2 pi to the fourth. That is first of all a Lorentz invariant integration measure in momentum space, then times 2 pi times this delta function of p square minus m square. 2 pi uh, means that our convention is that every Fourier integral in momentum space gets a 1 over 2 pi and every delta function in momentum space gets a 2 pi. So of course they, they cancel to some extent here. But this combination is Lorentz invariant, right? Because this is Lorentz invariant, that is Lorentz invariant, and therefore the combination is Lorentz invariant as well. And so we can uh, go one step further and we can also introduce a delta a theta function for the energy component uh, so that theta function is this step function, it's plus one if uh, p0 is positive and it's zero if p0 is negative. And what that simply requires is that the integral extends only over positive values of the energy component, which is a physical requirement. And so um, it remains Lorentz invariant if we add this because under a continuous Lorentz transformation the sign of the energy component cannot change if uh, p square is plus m square. Therefore this whole thing is Lorentz invariant. And so that is a nice integration measure that we can use to write down Lorentz invariant Fourier transformations. And you see that in our field expression this delta function must appear Therefore, it is very natural to, from now on, express our field as a Fourier integral, which uses this measure instead of the general four-dimensional measure. This then automatically implements the klein gordon equation. But let's do a small calculation. What actually is that? What happens if we apply this? We can actually evaluate the delta function because we can integrate over the energy component here in this integral. If we do the p0 integration, then what remains is a three-dimensional 
integration over the spatial components of the momentum, d3p over 2 pi cube, 1, 2 pi has cancelled. And then if we do the p0 integration, you have to um, uh, regard the argument of the delta function as a function of p0, and that is actually p0 square minus p vector square minus m square. If you regard it as a function of p0 and you integrate over p0, you get this usual uh, integration rule where you get the derivative of the argument of the delta function in the denominator if you integrate over it. And so what we get here is 1 over the derivative of that with respect to p0, and that is just 1 over p0, 1 over 2p0. And so here p0 is now the result of the integration over the delta function, so p0 is now an abbreviation of the result from the delta function p vector square plus m square, and we take the positive root because of that theta function. So all of that is combined in this simple symbol dp tilde, which I will from now on use, but behind that symbol you see a Lorentz invariant uh, representation with a delta function and a theta function, and you can also write it in this way, and we will also use that representation quite frequently. So if you see d3p divided by 2p0, that looks very non-Lorentz invariant, but it is actually Lorentz invariant because of that calculation. So this is our first result from considering the Klein-Gordon equation of our field operator, that the general Fourier transformation is too general. If we want that our field satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, we must use this Lorentz invariant measure. Then there is a second thing that we should use, namely our field operator is actually real, and for the operator that means phi is equal to phi Decker as the operator. And therefore, um, such a general Fourier ansatz easily gives you a complex result, because uh, there is no compensation for the complex ingredients here of this uh, exponential function, for example. But if you want that the result is real, then we get now a very general or completely general expression. Together with this here, we get the following general Fourier ansatz, which is our field operator phi hat of x is given by this Lorentz invariant measure dp tilde uh, times e to the minus ipx times some quantity a sub p. Okay. This alone is completely general. It only satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. And it contains only positive uh, momentum components. And then we must uh, make it Hermitian, and therefore we just add the Hermitian conjugate e to the plus ipx times a dagger of p. And then this is the most general representation that you can write down, which automatically satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation and which is Hermitian. And in this equation, this is the way we will uh, typically use it, but there is a lot going on. I remember, I remind you again, p tilde is defined here, so this is an abbreviation for this three-dimensional integral with 2p0 in the denominator. And it also implies that the component p0 is never a variable, but is always used as an abbreviation for this. And that happens not only in the integration measure, but it, for example, also happens here in the exponent. So in this uh, px is, of course, p mu x mu, so that would be p0 times x0 minus p vector times x vector. And uh, that p0 here is, again, the square root. So we have here a specific dispersion relation between the energy and the momentum, uh, like we did in the Schrödinger field quantization. 
And now, of course, you see a decisive difference to the Schrödinger case, to the non-relativistic case, and that, that difference is the appearance of the A-Decker term here. So we must accompany the A with an A-Decker, because otherwise the operator would not be Hermitian. And so that shows you, if you interpret this again as creation or annihilation for particles, that annihilates a particle, that creates a particle. Therefore, the field operator uh, either changes the particle number by plus one or by minus one, and therefore particle number will in general not be a conserved quantity, which is what we already uh, imagine for a relativistic quantum theory. And here it's for the first time explicitly implemented in this operator, and it comes from an innocent looking origin. It comes from the hermeticity of the operator here. Good. Now, next step, look at the commutation relations. So we need to plug this expression into uh, our expression for pi. The pi operator is phi dot, and you can evaluate phi dot by taking the time derivative. That would give you here a prefactor minus i p0, and here a prefactor plus i p0. So uh, it's easy to obtain an explicit expression for pi. And you can also plug it into the commutators. The commutators between phi and pi must have certain values, namely phi with phi is zero, phi with pi is i times the delta function. And uh, then you can solve the commutation relations for commutation relations between a and a dagger. So those commutation relations for phi and pi are equivalent to certain relations between a and a dagger. And let's not do the calculation explicitly here. Let's just write down the result. You are invited to do the calculation at home. It's just plugging in Fourier transformations. And then you get that a with a must commute and a with a dagger with two different arguments must give a non-zero result proportional to a delta function, but the normalization is a little bit different because our Fourier integral contains this two pi cubed times two p zero. Our normalization here has two pi cubed times two p zero in the numerator. Okay. Uh, times a three-dimensional delta function between p and p prime. So these are the equivalent commutation relations for the A's, uh, which um, give the desired commutation relations for phi and pi. And now these commutation relations are familiar to us because they again are the same as for the harmonic oscillator. A with A is zero, A with A dagger is essentially one. Um, but uh, we have infinitely many different P's, therefore this continuum normalization, but it's really again an infinite set of independent harmonic oscillators. And uh, so far this is identical to the case of the Schrödinger field and the interpretation is the same. However, it's not yet completely guaranteed that this interpretation makes complete sense. And we discussed the same issue also in the Schrödinger case. We also need to know uh, whether they really create energy. That means we need to know the commutation relations of them with the Hamiltonian. And only if that is also the same as for the harmonic oscillator, the interpretation makes sense. And uh, so let us do that. Um, we already know that h with phi of x gives essentially phi dot. Now I forgot, of course, the sign. What is the correct sign? h with phi times i gives phi dot of x. And uh, now you can plug in this representation for phi 
and for phi dot, and you can read off the individual Fourier components, and then you can immediately see. So let's read off the Fourier components. For example, you can read off the Fourier component proportional to the second exponential function, the component proportional to e to the plus e i p x, and then you obtain the commutation relation of a h with a dagger of p. So if you read off the Fourier mode proportional to e to the i p x, uh, you get on the right hand side phi dot. Phi dot uh, contains as a prefactor i times p0 times that i that cancels. So you get just p0 as a prefactor in front of the same a dagger. So you see that the commutator of h with a dagger is plus p0 times a dagger. That means a dagger creates energy and the amount of energy it creates is p0, where again p0 is an abbreviation for the square root, so it's a positive energy that is created here. And this then really shows that what we have here is an infinite set of independent harmonic oscillators, each of which uh, acts exactly in the identical way as the familiar harmonic oscillators from ordinary quantum mechanics. So in particular, let me highlight this is bigger or equal to zero. And so that means that H can also be represented by these creation and annihilation operators. Now this is a normal D3P integral times P0 times A dagger A with argument P and P plus some numerical constant which is irrelevant. You can show this by checking that this operator has the same commutation relations as uh, the Hamiltonian must have, and then since the operators are really defined by their commutation relations with all the basic operators, uh, you know that these operators H defined in this way and H defined in the previous way, they are the same. And this is an exercise to explicitly show it. And, uh, then you will also find what is this constant here, which is actually divergent, but nevertheless, for the commutation relations, we can drop it. So let's write down this result. For each momentum p, the system behaves like a harmonic oscillator. Therefore, we now know what is our space of quantum states. Namely, our space must consist of a vacuum state, which is defined by A acting on it gives zero for all P. So such a vacuum state must exist, and uh, otherwise you run into this problem of infinitely negative energies or negative norm states. So this state must exist, and then all the other states of the uh, Hilbert space can be constructed by acting with a daggers with any arguments on the vacuum state. So these states obtained in this way, they form a basis of our Hilbert space. And so therefore we can say we have constructed all the operators and space of states They are all completely constructed. Therefore, we have done our job of canonically quantizing this classical field theory. And we obtain a space of states uh, of particles. Again, each uh, single excitation a dagger on the vacuum gives us a wave quantum, which behaves like a particle with uh, energy P0, of course, because that is created by this A dagger, and also with a certain momentum.
the only thing which we cannot yet prove is what is the momentum of the particle because we do not yet have the momentum operator. But otherwise, we have constructed the theory and the interpretation should be quite clear. So, so far at this point, it looks similar to the non-relativistic case. Only the details of how the field operator phi looks like, this is dramatically different because of the automatic combination of A and A dagger in one single field operator. Now the battery is empty. Okay, therefore, let us go on. Even though we have in some sense constructed our theory, there are still some uh, other issues that we can think about. And uh, one I've just alluded to because you might like to know what is the momentum of those states that we create out of the vacuum by doing a decker on the vacuum. How can we find out? We need to construct a momentum operator and then check whether those states are eigenstates of that momentum operator with certain eigenvalues. You might guess the eigenvalue is this p vector, and you would be right. But that needs to be checked and proven. And so anyway, it's good to construct a momentum operator. But even more interestingly, what is the spin of the particles that we have defined here? And is the theory relativistic? A relativistic quantum theory must have a unitary representation of the Poincaré group, U of lambda and A, right? And so at least uh, in the beginner stage that we are now, we should better uh, seriously construct this representation U of lambda and A and uh, check that it's unitary. And at the same time, we uh, will then automatically obtain the other generators, for example, for angular momentum we will get angular momentum operators. And they have some eigenvalues and eigenstates too. And uh, again, the angular momentum in the rest frame is the spin. And so we can then take one of those particles, put it to the rest frame, check whether it's an eigenstate to angular momentum with some eigenvalue, and then we obtain what is the spin of those particles. And so what we really need now are the generators for, for the Poincaré representation. And how we, do we obtain them? Of course, from the Noether theorem, because we know that the Noether theorem guarantees us conserved quantities which are related to Poincaré invariants. They will, uh, it will give us explicit expressions for all the conserved quantities. And so we obtain them, and then we have all, all we need. So that is our section 224, the Poincaré generators. So, and what we simply do is we go to Noether's theorem and construct those conserved currents. And we already know, uh, since we did it today, uh, what we need to do. We need to write our field transformation in a certain way, as we know that Poincaré transformations give us some infinitesimal or continuous transformation of the field. In general, our field transforms under Poincaré in the following way. Phi goes to phi prime, where, by definition, phi prime at lambda x plus a is equal to phi of x. 
That is the defining property of a classical scalar field. Now we can write this infinitesimally. Phi uh, prime of x plus omega x plus epsilon, where omega x is an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation and epsilon is an infinitesimal translation, is equal to phi of x. And that is equivalent to saying that phi prime of the old point x is equal to the old phi at the inverse transformed point x minus omega x minus epsilon and that we can Taylor expand. That is the same as phi of x minus omega x plus epsilon with some indices, let's say uh, overall index mu, let's say omega mu nu x nu epsilon mu times d mu phi of x, right? That is just Taylor expansion. We have here an infinitesimal shift of the argument. Here we do Taylor expansion in that infinitesimal shift, therefore we get here this first derivative. And the indices are correct as they are, so we have here of this object here an open index mu times d by dx mu. That is our field transformation and that should be regarded as phi of x plus delta phi of x. And so that is what I meant in the beginning of the lecture today. You need to write the infinitesimal transformation in a form where your transformation has the same space-time argument as the original field. And that is what we have now achieved by doing this Taylor expansion. So I can also write it explicitly, delta phi is given by minus omega mu nu x nu d mu phi minus epsilon mu d mu phi. That is our delta phi. And we hope that our theory is invariant under Poincaré transformations. That means now we plug that into the Lagrangian. And of course we do not have to calculate, it's clear that uh, the Lagrangian behaves like this. So if you just look at the Lagrangian as a function of x, x because it depends on fields and the fields depend on x, so ultimately the Lagrangian is also a function of x, then of course it goes into uh, L plus delta L at the same x, which has exactly the same transformation law, where delta L is given by minus omega mu nu x nu d mu l minus epsilon mu d mu l. So the Lagrangian is also a scalar and therefore it behaves in the identical way. We do not have to do any calculation to figure that out. And then um, uh, let's not follow my recommendation, which is of course that whenever you use the Noether theorem, go once again through the proof because anyway, it's very easy. It takes two minutes, but today we have done the proof, therefore let's not do it this time. So let's, uh, now we still remember the result from one hour ago, therefore let's use it. So from this, we see that our Lagrangian transforms into a total derivative, so maybe let's make that explicit. We should write that as d rho of something, and we can write it as d rho of something by uh, factoring out the derivative. So here we have, for example, minus epsilon rho times uh, L, and here we have d rho of minus omega rho nu x nu times L. Okay, so we see that our Lagrangian transforms into a total derivative which was called x rho in the general derivation. So our Noether theorem tells us now the following. 
that we get a conserved current. Who still remembers the form of the conserved current? It's maybe also in your notes, but uh, do you still remember it? It was the derivative d by d rho, and then you have here the Lagrangian derivative with respect to the derivative of the fields, dl by d d rho phi times the field variation delta phi. That was one term in the current. And then you have to correct if that x exists minus x rho. In many cases that x is actually zero and then the conserved current is just this. So what is that here? What is it here? dl by d d rho phi, we already had it, that is d rho phi. Okay. Then delta phi, delta phi is over there, so we get minus omega mu nu x nu uh, d mu phi minus epsilon mu d mu phi and here minus x, x is actually minus this, so we get here pluses, plus omega rho nu x nu times L, and here plus epsilon rho times L. That is our conserved current. And this, why are you laughing? Surprised or intimidating? Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, but why is it intimidating? By the way, you can use this as a blueprint for your exercise, so please do it. Uh, that is exactly the general way that you can always follow, so please go uh, in the same manner through the exercise. And why is it intimidating? Because of course there are all over the place omegas and epsilons appearing. What is the meaning of the omegas and epsilons? Those are the parameters for our translation and Lorentz transformation. So here this current is still completely general for any Lorentz transformation and translation that we can possibly do. We always get this form for the conserved current. But what we are normally interested in is a specific conserved quantity for translation, which would be momentum, and another specific quantity for, uh, for rotations, which would be angular momentum, and similarly for boosts. What does that mean? We can uh, read off the coefficients in front of one such epsilon. And the coefficient in front of one epsilon would be uh, the current corresponding to translational invariance. We can also read off the coefficients of omega, and those would be the, the currents which correspond to Lorentz transformations. We could also use a specific omega, for example, what is a rotation around the z-axis rotation around the z-axis has only omega 1, 2, non-zero. And so you could read off the coefficient in front of omega 1, 2. And that would give you the conserved current for rotation invariance around the z-axis, the angular momentum in z-direction. So you can read off all those coefficients and in this way how many conserved currents will we get? We will get 10 currents because we have four different epsilons and six anti-symmetric combinations of omega. And so then we have 10, but each of them is simpler than this one, okay? So let's do that. We have four conserved currents. Four translational invariants. And for that we take the coefficient of, let's do um, minus epsilon because we see here if we take minus epsilon then the minus drops out. So let's take the coefficient of minus epsilon lower index mu. This defines us the following quantities, t rho mu. T 
T rho mu is the, the, the definition of our conserved quantity and its coefficient in front of minus epsilon mu. So what is that? So here we have T rho phi. Then the coefficient of minus epsilon mu is T mu phi with upper index mu. And here the coefficient of epsilon mu, here we have epsilon rho, so we have first of all minus, then we have a metric tensor g mu rho times L. Okay. Why are these four currents? This is a tensor with 16 different components, but it corresponds to four currents, namely for every mu, this is a current and the index of the current is rho. So the meaning of rho and mu is very different. Mu corresponds to which translation are we doing into x, y, z direction or into time direction, and that corresponds to our continuity equation. The zero rho component means the density, and the spatial components here mean the current density of the appropriate conserved quantity. And so anyway, we have the conservation law, d rho, t rho mu is equal to zero for all mu. Okay. These are four, translation, uh, four conservation laws for translational invariance. And similarly, let's just finish this for um, the six conserved currents for Lorentz invariance. So let us take the coefficient in front of what should we take uh, the omega with plus or minus. Let's do plus omega lower index mu nu. Let's do it with plus. And uh, that is anti-symmetric minus omega nu mu. And so we have to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize our coefficient. So then we get six quantities, and I call them curly M rho, with upper index mu nu, and that is anti-symmetric. It's the same as M rho nu mu. And again, rho is the index for the current. Mu nu is the index for which Lorentz transformation are we considering. Okay, so let's read it off. M rho mu nu is equal to the following. First, D rho. Phi. And then here the coefficient of omega with lower indices. Uh, and anti-symmetrized we get this minus the same thing with the opposite indices. And that is then x mu d nu minus x nu d mu acting on phi. And here the coefficient of omega uh, with um, anti-symmetric and omega mu is the following, minus g rho mu x nu minus g rho nu x mu times the Lagrangian times L. And then we have the conservation law, d mu m rho mu nu is equal to zero for all mu nu. So these are six conserved currents. And then we have it. These are our conserved currents for Poincaré invariance. And uh, time is up, so let us not um, do any more details. But clearly from this, you can then define conserved quantities, charges, by integrating over d3x. You take the zero component of the current, integrate over d3x, then you get a conserved quantity, and that would be here energy and momentum, and here angular momentum and boost operators. And then we can turn to the quantum theory, just replace uh, fields by quantum operators, and we have expressions for momentum and angular and boost operators in our quantum theory, we can check that they are Hermitian, and then we have a unitary representation of Lorentz transformations. And we can also check how our particle states uh, behave 
under the action of those Lorentz transformations, and then we will figure out what the spin of the particles actually is. Okay, thank you, and uh, then see you on Thursday.